Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. It's KLOS New and Approved. You know, one of my favorite bands growing up was Kiss, of course, and I love this guy because not only is he uh, one of the greatest guitar players in the history of rock, metal, whatever you want to call it, but, uh, you know, he's such a big, big part of my my childhood and my adulthood because, you know, I never stopped really ever uh, loving the records that mean so much to me. So I'm here with Ace Freely, who's got a new record coming out February 23rd. It's called 10,000 Volts. We've been playing the single on the air, and it's it's some great stuff. Ace, it's good to see you again, man. How you doing? It's wonderful to be alive. <laughs> That's what I say every day. You know, I'm so surprised the response I've been getting from the new single. It's by far the biggest response I've ever got from a single since New York Groove. I know it's incredible when you think back about it now. You know, um. I'll, I, I, somebody said to me that they love the record. Reminds them of when they got the first Fraley's Comet record, and but I'm like, this song is really knocking people out. So, have I you was, heard the whole record? Yes, I have. I've listened to the, I've listened to the whole record, man. I love uh, like, you know, things like fighting, you know, fighting for life. I love that. Uh, I mean, there's there's you know, there's a bunch of great songs on the record. Walking on the Moon, the second tune's really killer. You know, uh, there's a lot of good songs on there. So blind did there's some good stuff, you know. So yeah, I was just on the phone with the record company, and we're talking about uh, the format of what we're going to do for the video and Cherry Medicine. Cherry Medicine, which, right? Uh, the third song on the song. record. That's a good one. Third song on the record, uh, so people will, will have it and hear it soon. But I love the way the video was done for Ten Thousand Volts, Ace, and you look great. I wanted to also say thank you. You know, uh, you gave me one of my actual childhood dreams. You and uh, Peter and Gene, I got to sing with you guys at Cole's Rehearsal Studio back in 1998. You were rehearsing for Psycho Circus, and uh, I sang Rock Bottom, 100,000 Years, and Do You Love Me with you. And that was, looking over and having you next to me was one of the uh, greatest moments. I'm telling you, I talk to people about it. It's still one of those things that was a... So thank you for making a ch my childhood dream come true. I want to tell you how much I appreciate it. That's my job, making people happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a good time. I really enjoyed doing that. But, you know, Ace, we got to talk. I mean, when I look back on my favorite, you know, so many great songs that you've written and things I love. Um, you know, the first record uh, that I got in my kiss was Hotter Than Hell, and then I went back and got the first, but Strange Ways. You know, things that you put on Parasite. I mean, I love your songwriting, and then when you, were, when you started singing on tracks, too, uh, it made me really happy. So it's great you got this record out. And during a pandemic, you know, you did those Origins records. I love those, too, because it read like uh, ch a childhood and then like, you know, teen year playlist for me with things that we loved, whether it's Paul Revere and the Raiders or the Animals or Thin Lizzy Mountain. You know, there were so many cool things on there. Was I got to ask you about well, that. At, at, the, at the time, uh, Ken Gullick, who isn't with the uh, label anymore, but it was his concept to do uh, Arzen's Volume 1. And uh, the cool thing about it is I get a chance to redo songs that influenced me when I was a teenager. And, uh, you know, I did Cream songs, Hendrix songs, you know, Led Zeppelin songs. I mean, and it was so much fun doing them and getting special guest stars to, you know, jump on a track. You know, Lita did uh, Jumping Jack Flash. I had Slash playing on... Uh, Emerald, right? The Thin Lizzy song, Emerald. Yes. And, uh, it's, and right now, I'm trying... even. <laughs> Even though the album, the new album isn't released yet, we're already talking about Origins Volume 3, and we're already planning ahead uh, what kind, of, what special guest stars we're going to get on that record, and we're going to try to get some real big ones. Yeah, I love that you got Robin Zander, your old friend, because, you know, they got... They toured with yeah. Kiss back in the day, um, you know, when they, after their first album came out. Um, but he did 30 Days in the Hole, Steve Marriott rocking the Humble Pie, which is great, too. Uh, there's no way I was going to sing that. You know, <laughs> I have a limited range. <laughs> yeah. But and, it came out great, right? I mean, it was good. Well, he killed it, you know. Robin just, you know, took that song and ripped it a new asshole. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Ace, man, I, I love it. Ace, you know, people always wonder, you know, I explained to my girlfriend, one of her favorite things, obviously, she loves uh, New York Groove. And you, you know, and 
So I played her the rest of, uh, you know, your first solo album. It was the most successful of all those four Kiss albums. Biggest single, too. Um, but, you know, the story, I explained to her that it was a song by this band called Hello out of the U.K. Um, and, you know, Joan Jett found I Love Rock and Roll watching a TV show, saw the Arrows cover it, and became a big hit for her. I always wanted to ask you, how did you discover uh, the New York Groove song by Hello? Because, I mean, you made it your own, and yours is the definitive, but how did you find it? Well, that 78 solo album was a real special record for me. I was doing it on my own. It was basically in the studio, just me, Anton Figg, and Eddie Kramer p- producing. Yeah, and we had rented out the Colgate Mansion up in Connecticut, and uh, we just had so much fun uh, trying recording to, you know, I did most of my acoustic guitar work in the library, which was all wood. So, you know, we went, you know, I was using the bathroom, which was all marble to get like natural reverb. You know, back in the 70s, they didn't have the digital reverbs they have today. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing like real ambient sound yes like the sound of a room like real echo chambers when they had they you know like they they were actually the way the room was so you could get that 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 bounce back sound right and you know the secret of uh getting a great room sound is placement of the microphones you know like eddie used to sometimes place the mics uh facing away from the amps and into the corner of the room where the uh you know the bounce back would would, would converge, and uh, he close mic it, he, and he put mics, you know, three or four mics, and he bring them up on the board, and and you know blend in the sound to get a nice ambient sound. I mean, with Anton Fig, we had him set up in the foyer of the mansion, and he had mics up the staircase above him, and you know we were getting like these this big John Bonham sound on some of the drum tracks. Because it was just mic correctly. I mean, you know, Jimmy worked with the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, Eddie rather. And uh, with this new album, I uh, it was slightly different for me working with Steve Brown because up until this particular album, I, I had done most of them alone, produced them myself, and uh, but working with Steve was magic. You know, yeah. he. The he's such a talented he guy. He's he's a great musician. Yeah, he's, he's really talented. Here, and a great guitar player, and uh, he we've known each other, you know, but it was only on a very casual. Hey, how you doing? And my my fiance Laura knew him better than I knew him, and she said, "You got to get together with Steve," and she was the one that instigated the. Yeah, you know, me and Steve getting together. I had him send me over a couple of tracks. Uh, I listened to him, and one of the lines in the chorus was "Walking on the Moon," but it wasn't the ending line. So I said, "Look, that song. This song has to be called Walking on the Moon' because I'm the space man." Yes. <laughs> yeah. So he came over to my house, and we rewrote the song, we rewrote the lyrics, and uh, and I wrote a bridge for the song that didn't exist, and. Uh, from that point on, once we got that, you know, on hard drive, we we just started knocking them off one song after the next. And, you know, Steve's a much better guitar player than he is a lyricist. So uh, I wrote most of the lyrics uh, for these songs. And Steve did some great guitar work. You know, subtle stuff that's in the background. And he, Steve also harmonized with me on most of the tracks and he's got a much better range than me so uh it worked out great i'm so glad you got together with steve brown for this because you know he's such a talented guy and you guys and you live in pretty close proximity these days right in jersey and everywhere and in in the you know the whole northeast i have a studio in my basement which you can see yeah (laughs) and then uh steve has a, a slightly smaller studio in his basement and uh, what we once we got rolling, we would alternate from my studio to his studio. I drive to his place, he drive to mine. You know, and then when it went, you know, when dinner time came, you know, his wife would cook, you know, 
spaghetti and meatballs or lasagna or something, you know. And, you know, as two kids would be at the table, I'd start doing magic tricks. <laughs> yeah. Kids, because, you know, magic is kind of my hobby amongst other things. Yeah, of course. And uh, it was just, you know, it became like a family thing, you know. And then he had a barbecue and I met his mom and dad and we went out to dinner last week. Uh, me, uh, me and Laura, him and his wife, and uh, it was like a Italian restaurant, but it was like a mob joint, and I'm meeting all these mob guys and taking photos with them. And uh, the owner was sitting down next to me, and he was a huge Ace fan. And he, next thing you know, he pulls out his phone and he's got uh, videos of me playing at BB King's in Manhattan. That he was at the show, right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And uh, he would, you know, he was showing me pictures of his of his guitar collection and stuff, and uh, we just got along famously, and it was a great night. That's amazing. Well, you know, you know how many fans you have out there listening to Snowblind. You know, there's so many things. Again, um, I can go, I can go go through so many, but I'm happy. I'm really happy with the way this record sounds. Great. I mean, it's uh, to me, it's one of the, one of the best solo records you've done. Right. I mean, I love it. I think it's it's strong. I think it's going to, you know, be, people are going to compare it to my first solo record, you know, because it's that good. You know, my first solo record, there's not a, there's no filler on it. Yeah. I don't think there's any filler on this album either. Yeah, Ozone. And so so I, I got to ask you one more, uh, just really quickly though, Ace. So tell me about New York Groove finding the song because I still I still don't know that answer and because I'm your big one of your. I forgot, you, I forgot you asked me that question. Oh, that's I was okay. On a tangent. No, but that's all right because I learned about how you recorded the first record too, so that's really good. I mean, it's interesting. I never movie. wanted to do the song, and Eddie kept hounding me. He go, "This could be a single," and I said, "Yeah, but it doesn't go with any of the other tracks." You know, it's not hard rock, heavy metal, you know, and that's what I'm known for, you know. Like when I was in the guitarist and Kiss, actually at the time I was still performing with Kiss. So, uh, but he said, look, trust me, let's just record it and see how it comes out. And it came out great. And we didn't actually record that up in Sharon, Connecticut, where the Colgate Mansion was. We recorded it in a recording studio at Radio City Music Hall in Manhattan. The one on top of it, right? There's that... one up in the back, up the staircase, and, you know, the Rockettes used to pass the studio going to the roof, and they would sun themselves, And but they more often than not come in and listen for a little bit, and uh, that was kind of a nice uh, little break. <laughs> yeah, So, but it's amazing, though, because that's cool. It was recorded in New York City where, like, the Rockettes are a radio city where all so much action and right in that center part of town and the songs written about it and originally done by an English band, right? I mean, it was those guys, hello. But so Eddie brought you the song. Was he the one who said, hey, you got to check this out? Eddie, Eddie from day one wanted me to do the song and uh, I was totally against it. Yeah. And he had to really cajole me in, into doing the song and eventually I said, okay, let's let's try it. And, you know, I want to smack myself in the head because it was my biggest hit. <laughs> yeah. It's such a great track. And uh, and I love it. And, you know, and it took it to a... It, it had more life when you recorded it than that version by Hello, which is cool, you know? So I love what you guys ended up doing with it. Yeah, you don't got to ask... Everybody, everybody, there's a term that people use that are close to me, like especially on the Origins records where I'm taking a... a somebody else's song and redoing it. And people go, you got to ace it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And I'm, and I'm excited about that. You know, Ace, I got to ask you, who was it the first band that you saw live? When you were a kid and when you were growing up there in New York, were you going to any of those like Fillmore East shows? Were you, uh, or did you go to, did you see Brock bands playing high schools? What kind of stuff? What were those early I went, shows? I went to a lot of shows at the Fillmore East, but prior to that, I remember cutting school one day and hopping on the subway with a friend of mine, and we went down to a Murray the K show at a theater in Midtown, and I don't remember exactly where it was, but. Uh, I ended up meeting Murray the K 
and Jackie the K, his wife, and uh, you know, he let us in for free because I, you know, at the time I, I looked like a rock star. I used to get into shows all the time without even tickets because they thought I was in the band or they thought, you know, I was connected to them in some some way, shape, or form. But uh, I went to see Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels because I really. Uh, Jim McCarty, their lead guitarist, was a big influence on me as well. And we happen to be really good friends at this juncture because we toured together uh, when I put out the Fraley's Comet records. And he, uh, after uh, Mitch Ryder went off, next thing I know, The Cream comes on, who I, I didn't know anything about. And then The Who comes on. You know, and 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 Pete's wrecking his smashing his guitar to the amp, and Keith Moon's wrecking his drum set, and smoke bombs are going off, and I just said this is amazing. And uh, Roger Dalton was fabulous when he swung the mic around and caught it uh, without ever missing it. In fact, Paul used to do that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he got it from Roger Daltrey. but. Uh, I stole a lot of things from uh, Pete Townsend. You know, everybody says to me, oh, you, you're the guy that does the toggle switch thing, you know? And uh, I got that from Pete because Pete did that. Yeah, you and saw I those. He didn't invent that, that little stick, you know, using it at the end of songs and slowing, slowing things down. Uh, but I always have, you know, people don't realize that I only use the treble pickup, the bridge pickup. So I I disconnect the middle pickup and the uh uh the what what's it called yeah the one calls us to the neck yeah and uh, I disconnect them so uh, because I I never use those pickups and I just use the travel pickup I use the Marzios super distortions and uh, that through a Marshall lamp is my sound. And yeah, it has been your. You don't have to work too hard with a Les Paul, you know. Yeah, it's a great thing. I love those shows that you went to because now you're talking about that. You know, Murray the K man was a, a le you know what a New York legend, right? INS, and then eventually, like years later on NBC, but and Jackie, his wife was like on General Hospital years later. I remember, you know, like that kind of thing. She was I didn't know that really. Yeah, she was actually on it in the '80s when it went through that re when General Hospital got really big with Luke and Laura. And all that stuff. Jackie Zeman was a main character there. After wasn't you know, Rick Springfield on that show? Yeah, as it was well? at that time. Suppose you know, like around that. But I love that you were there because you know it's crazy too, Ace. When you think about how cool that is that you went to a show with like Mitch Ryder. I mean, how great were the Detroit Wheels? And he was like on a fire as a performer, right? I mean, Devil in the Blue Amazing. Dress, Jenny Take a Ride, Socket to Me Baby. Those are all great songs. Devil with a Blue Dress on. I yeah. love the guitar solo in that. Song. Yeah. Yeah, right before it goes into Kigali Miss Molly, it's so badass, right? It's great. And I love that because I was a young kid when that came out, and I love that. I love those records. I had a 45s. And uh, he was on a label called Dino Voice. I remember it. But, you know, it was cool. You went to see that. Then you saw Cream and the Who. And I wonder if it was one of those Cream shows because when they were actually recording Disraeli Gears, they were doing five nights in a row in New York City playing somewhere. <laughs> Like I and back then we do four songs, three songs. You know what I mean at those shows, but still pretty wild. You know when I remember when Kiss first started out. I mean, we uh, within eighteen months we did two or three records and toured. I, I I don't know how we did it, or you know, it was just like I was. I felt like I was on a runaway roller coaster and I couldn't get off. You know, it was. Uh, but it was fun. I was having a ball. I was a kid, you know, beautiful women knocking on my door, you know. I mean, it was amazing. Those three records are fantastic. I love all three of those, like, start to finish. I love those records so much. One, just uh, Hotter Than Hell, Just to Kill, in a row. It's amazing it was 18 months. I, You know, I think about that now, and, uh, you know, it's... It just flew by, didn't it, at that period of time? Because, you know, then... And then when a live hit... Yeah. That, you know, we after a live became a big hit, we went from playing theaters uh, to fucking, you know, Madison Square Garden and the Forum and 
it just it was almost like an overnight we were an overnight sensation. That album was so popular, and so many guitar players cite that album as a reason why they picked up the guitar. You know, from listening to my guitar solo. Oh, so many and so many people I talk to and have always like that time I got I got to sing with you and Gene and uh, Peter. Was, was like I said, amazing for me. When I told Tom Morello, when I told Dave Navarro, when I told some of these other rock guys, they were blown away because they're like, you, you know, like every, you know, those guys, they picked up guitars because they bought Kiss Alive, you know what I mean? Or Destroyer, oh. or, you know, um, and uh, I'm, I, again, I always say I'm so grateful that I had a neighbor kid, I mean, a kid who moved into town. He was from Liverpool. And he had the first Kiss album, and I looked at it and went, "Holy shit, who are these guys?" You know, I was uh, I was like eleven years old, twelve, and then I went out and bought Hotter Than Hell. It just got released, and then that was I was. Want to hear a funny story? When we were doing the photo session for the album cover, yeah, Neil Bogart called, and he said, "Are you guys sure you want to wear that makeup?" <laughs> I mean, <laughs> crazy things were. It was just like you know. No one was 100% convinced that the makeup was going to be as huge as it's turned out to be. And uh, we just said, look, we're sticking to our guns. This is us. These costumes, the makeup, the whole nine yards. You know, we got influenced by Alice Cooper, obviously. You know, The Who was a big influence on us because, you know, they were a theatrical group. And we wanted to be a theatrical group. And, uh, you know, Alice started wearing the makeup and... uh, I remember me and Paul Stanley, you know, we we went to see the Billion Dollar Baby tour and we didn't have we didn't have any money for good seats and we ended up sneaking down little by little to get to the front and when Alice walked down the staircase and started singing Billion Dollar Baby, we both just like said, "Oh my god, he he looked like a fucking god up there." Yeah. And it he was, was amazing. amazing. And you guys knew you. I mean, you guys took it to a whole new level, and it was it was just so great. Uh, we're looking back on all of that for me. I I absolutely love it. You know what else? Uh, you guys used to listen to like any W two right, and listen to things from England. You guys were always checking out new music, from what I understand, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was uh, when we had the time. Yeah. You know? yeah. But you know, when I think back, you know, we went to Japan. We, well, when we landed in Japan, there were 5,000 kids waiting for us. It was like when the Beatles came to America. <laughs> I you mean, they ended up jumping on the limousine, even on the roof. The roof was denting the limo. I thought we were going to get crushed, but uh, it was amazing. And then we did, I don't know, a couple of nights at the Budokan and uh, performed in some other venues and some other cities. And it was just a blast. The Japanese people were always so gracious and bowed and um, never had a problem with them. And every time I've been back to Japan since, I've always had a great time in Japan. Oh, it's amazing, Ace. And then you guys did Destroyer and got together with Bob Ezrin for that one. And uh, I know Bob was in the studio with you guys. And uh, I remember being a kid and, you know, here in Detroit Rock City and having the inner sleeve with the, with part of the lyrics on it and being bl- blown away. Every kid in the neighborhood would be like, you got to hear the song. You got to come in and hear the album intro and into King of the, the Nighttime beginning. World, all that great stuff. You in know? the beginning with Bob, Bob was kind of like a tyrant and, uh, but not really, but he set us, we were in like a classroom and he was up front with, with a blackboard and he was like trying to sit, tell us we don't know shit about music. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I'm going to take you guys to another level. Like I took Alice Cooper and uh, yeah, I mean that Destroyer album speaks for itself. It's unbelievable how great it is. Yeah, it's just one of the you know one of my. It, it was it was everybody as kids we were just we were blown away when we brought it home. You know, hey, let's talk about the photo session for Dress to Kill, right? You guys had to borrow the suits for that cover, right? Uh, when you were taking that picture uh, on the cover of Dress uh, to we, Kill, we ended up going up to Bill Coin's apartment and raided his closet. <laughs> That's a great story. We didn't have suits. Yeah, and Gene ended up borrowing my clogs, those white clogs he was wearing, and uh, I forget what the hell I was wearing. Maybe some white loafers. Uh, but, you know, 
back in those days, we, we really didn't plan stuff sometimes. We just, it was a lot of spontaneity that was happening. And uh, it, we had, for some reason, even though the four of us came from four different backgrounds, when the four of us got together, there was a chemistry that I can't even verbalize. Absolutely, a hundred percent. It was a uh, one of the all time greats. You know, well, uh, you know, obviously, you know, then uh, you know, rock and roll over and love gun. But I want to say, you know, it's kind of cool. What I love that you did, besides loving Rocket Ride and the things that were on on the studio side of Kiss Alive too, it was cool that you guys did any way you want it by Dave Clark Five. I mean, because that really represents what you as kids were like hearing on the radio and listening to, right? Like all that great British invasion stuff. Well, you know, we, we, you know, we were willing to take chances and obviously <laughs> with that makeup, that was a huge chance because it could have, it could have gone, could have gone South, but luckily, yeah. I remember playing like clubs in the South, you know, with rednecks. And we'd get up on stage and it was like all these rednecks, you know, drinking beer and, you know, they had their arms crossed going, all right, show us what you can do. And, uh, you know, once by, by the time we were halfway through the set, these guys were up on their, up on their feet, you know, and then, you know, we usually end with deuce or, uh, something similar, rock and roll night. And, uh, by the end of the night, you know, we had we had the the we had the audience a hundred percent, you know, behind us, and we toured extensively, and I think that's one of the reasons uh, we became so popular. Oh yeah, it was it was it was amazing. Yeah, we were never off the road, and even when we didn't have shows, I remember we were down in Atlanta, Georgia. We didn't have shows for three weeks. And the record company said, J we're just going to put you up in the Ramada Inn and stay down there because, you know, with the show and the equipment and everything, it's, it's cheaper to just put you up in rooms. You know, I was I was rooming with Gene. Peter was rooming with Paul. Yeah, everybody doubled up. You know, this was before we made big money and each of us got our own suites, which was nice. But, uh, you know... There was a brotherhood going on back there. It was before we became millionaires, and it was uh, we were still, you know, still trying to, you know, top the next guy, and uh, it just all broke wide open with the uh, live album. The packaging I thought was really special, we, you know, and it was kind. Of, the packaging was like a souvenir of the show, and I think that's another reason why that album was so successful. Yeah, it gave kids, I think it gave uh, people that were music fans and rock fans the experience by looking at it that you were at a show and it was something exciting to be a part of. Like the way it looked inside the front cover. You know, even the picture with the girls on the back of it, you know, with the Kobo Hall, you know, like uh, holding the, you know, the, the poster there, right? Yeah, it was a trip. It was cool. I loved. I just love that. You know, when I hear the stories about you guys on the road back in the day, and you know, again, that it was all new back then. You know, like we, we you were, you were, you guys were part of the inventing the wheel. You know, you were experiencing it all for people for years to come. You know, right? You didn't that, like anybody else didn't know what you were really doing, just making it up I as you go along. Right? I remember the levitate, the first levitating drum set we got uh, made for Peter. And he would go up, you know, it was on a chain drive and sometimes it would uh, slip. Yeah. Now he'd be playing and I could see it was rocking a little. And, you know, he had to have his drums really tightened down, you know, with with elastic straps and stuff or his drums would have fallen off. And uh, sometimes, you know, it was a little tricky. You know, we weren't sure he was going to make it all the way to the top. And in some clubs, he couldn't make it all the way to the top because the ceiling was too low. <laughs> yeah, he's like trying to like kind of time out. You do Black Diamond, right? And then come down and like up and at the right. That's amazing. That's uh, you guys said, uh, you guys, like I said, and it was just great the way you took the theatrical thing. I love the story. I love that you told me that you used to like, you just look like a rock star. So Barry Decay and all those people were like, he belongs here. That's a great way to get in when you have no money when you're a kid. Again, you're 
coming to you were a teen were you like a teenager like you know like 18 19 well the murder case show i was 15 but i still had hair longer than my hair is right now wow that's great and, uh, you know i looked like i was in one of the bands i mean i my theory was if you want to become a rock star you have to look like a rock star you know when i walked into the audition you know paul and gene yeah, they looked at me and, they, you know, if you remember the ad that they had uh, put in the Village Voice, somebody with flash and balls or whatever, whatever the statement was, you know, I knew I knew I could pull that off because not only could I play well, but I had a stage presence. Yeah, you certainly did, man. It was great. <laughs> and you inspired it. Like I said, I, lo I love it, Ace. I There's so much history there and. I still love all those records so much. I, I always enjoy them. I, it just, it's one of those things that just stays with you. You know what I mean? And, and I've had made more friendships over my uh, love of Kiss and you and the songs that all these relationships were built out of those things because you have that common thing with so many people. You know what I mean? That, and the difference between us and a lot of bands was, number one, we had four lead singers. I yes. mean, once... Once I, once I sang Shock Me at Madison Square Garden, which was my first lead vocal ever, uh, you know, then I just wanted to do more and more. And then, you know, Peter, Peter had a great voice, but it was raspy, like Rod Stewart's voice. Paul's voice was great, and he was a great front man, and Gene had a different character to his voice. But, you know, we could, we could do three, four-part harmony, and uh, not every band can do that. You guys definitely had that, and that's one of the great things. It's true. You know, capitalized on that and uh, the show. I remember, you know, my my road manager going, "Be careful! Remember, there's going to be flames coming up." You know, and I remember several times when Gene breathed fire. Sometimes his hair would get caught. You know, and somebody would have to run out and throw a towel over his head to put out the flames. And sometimes uh, people probably thought it was part of the show, right? They <laughs> were like, hey, they meant to yeah, do that. It's fine. You know, I used to fall a lot because I'm notorious for my bad balance. And, you know, luckily Paul and Gene would make it look like it was part of the show. And they'd run over to me and do the kind of thing that they would do in the end of Black Diamond, where I do that solo on my knees. So yeah. you know, it was all for one, one for all. And uh, it was it was great. We were having we were having the time of our lives, and then it was really nutty when we did that uh, movie for Hanna Barbera, "Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park." Yeah, you know, uh, a good friend of mine and I watched that recently. Like during the pandemic, he had like a he, he had like a screen in his backyard, and uh, we watched we watched the movie with some friends. And you know, it's, I remember seeing it on TV the first time it aired in America. You know, waiting waiting for that to come on. It was it was so exciting because you know there wasn't enough rock that you loved on television. So, but interestingly enough, you know, uh, I've read interviews from Paul by Paul and Gene where they really don't like the movie, and I think the movie is great if you take it in the light of the fact that we're not actors, and it was kind of campy, but it was fun. It and was you, fun. That's you know, how you take it. You know, if you watch the movie with that mindset. You're gonna enjoy the movie because it's it's some parts are silly, but Jeanette Fraley. So are the uh, so are the three Stooges. <laughs> right, exactly. Who which we love absolutely without a question. But yeah, you know, it was a fun movie and like camp. You know, it's a TV film. It's of its time, but it's it's so enjoyable, and that's the thing that we think is great about it. We, I mean, we. It was funny. I remember, you know, since we shot that at. Uh, uh, Six Flags, you know, which is only 45 minutes from Manhattan. You know, we had a lot of celebrities coming on the set. Oh, you did that in Jackson, New Jersey? In like at Great Adventure, Six Flags? I didn't know no, that. No, no, we shot that in, outside of L.A. Oh, the one here. Okay, uh, yeah. More than one Six Flags. Yeah, there's like 20. <laughs> I know, you're right. I, I don't know. But I, I mean... The only thing I hated about the film was I would have to get up at uh, seven o'clock in the morning and be on the set by nine in makeup. And uh, some nights I'd be partying the night before with a hangover, and I go, "Oh Jesus, seven! It's already seven o'clock." Yeah, 
Some nights I didn't even go to sleep. I just said, fuck it. It's not worth going to sleep for an hour or two. <laughs> oh, I know those nights. <laughs> I definitely had them myself. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, but in those days, everybody was doing you know what. And yeah. It woke me up, you know? Yeah, staying awake uh, and doing the, the marching patterns. Uh, <laughs> it was the time, you know, at that period of time. But it's amazing. You know, the two aces, uh, what was wild is when we watched it during the pandemic, we watched the European version of it that they actually released in theaters where they use stuff from your solo albums as the soundtrack, different than the actual TV version of the movie. You know? I remember being on tour in Canada, and, I, yeah, for some reason it wasn't released in theaters in the U.S., but in Canada we went to go see ourselves on the big screen, and it was great. Yeah, and seeing that, like, and then, like I know it was like released in Europe and Brazil and all over the place. Like, uh, it was released as a movie. So there's two versions of it out there, you know, because of that, which is, which big, I know, Kiss, Kiss fans, big Kiss fanatics know and have. I mean, there were things that happened during the filming of that, and I was a little loaded at times. <laughs> you know, I'm easy to laugh, you know. For instance, men were sitting by the pool, you know, and the guy comes walking across the pool area, and he he tripped over uh, one of the stones and fell, and then got up. He cut his hand, but you know, of course, we just kept on shooting. And uh, every time he asked me a question, I'd start cracking up because in my mind, I'm watching, I'm think, I'm seeing him fall, and. Uh, I screwed up a couple of takes, more than a couple, but you know, eventually we got it. And uh, there was another part where we're inside. Uh, we shot the interiors at Culver City Studios, and uh, when uh, you know we had those talisman in a red box. Yeah. The, you know, one was a lightning bowl. I don't know. There were four talismen, and each of those talismen supposedly gave us our powers. You know, I could go like this and make the band disappear, you know, teleport the band from here to there. I mean, it, it, I had a lot of fun. I also rented a moped when we were working at Six Flags, you know, and they closed the park at 6 p.m., and nobody was in there. It was completely empty. And uh, I'd be riding around. You know, because, you know, it was paved nicely. And uh, a couple of times I crashed, but I had my costume on. It was almost like a football suit. That's <laughs> amazing. Crazy. There's one yeah. there's, there's one part of the film, too, where there's a fight. And it looks like, I think there's a black guy who's a stunt double, but they caught him from the side. And if you just look quickly, you're like, dude, that, somebody's, there's a black guy playing one of the members of Kiss. It was wild. You're talking about when they're in the horror thing. Yeah. Yeah, he got he gets hit by Frankenstein and he goes up and you can it's obvious it's not me in the makeup. Yeah. But that was the day I had an argument with the uh producer because uh I had gotten there with with a hangover and put on my makeup and uh I'm ready to go. I walk out of my trailer and uh just says to me the director goes, Hey, so we're not gonna need you till after lunch. I go, why didn't you fucking tell me that a while ago so I could have relaxed in my trailer and maybe caught up some sleep? And I got really pissed off and I just took off. That happened on more than one occasion. So I just jumped in my Mercedes and took off. My bodyguard followed me. And of course, I, I, I know how to drive fast. You know, the DeLorean affair, that notorious thing. I yeah. ended up in 12 police cars and I ended up getting away. But uh, they actually caught up with me later on. But uh, my bodyguard was following me, and I saw him in my rearview mirror, and I went doot, 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 went through a couple, couple of red lights and lost them. And I didn't even know where the hell I was. Next thing you know, I pull up, and it's the uh, Egyptian exhibit, the Tutankhamun exhibit. <laughs> yeah. It's something I was always fascinated with. I've always been fascinated with the pyramids and, you know, the Sphinx and, you know, the whole nine yards. And I've always wanted to go see the pyramids, but, you know, it was always, I was, you know, the government was saying it's not safe for Americans to travel there. So uh, I'm standing outside just looking at, uh, 
you know, the pictures and stuff of what's inside. And a woman came up to me and said, do you need a ticket? And people were scalping them for hundreds of dollars. And she just handed me a free ticket. And That's I, amazing. Went, I <laughs> went in, I walked through the whole thing, saw the beautiful mask of Tutankhamen in gold. And after that, I was I calmed down. I ended up driving back to the uh, set. I apologized to the director and producer and uh, everything went on as usual. That's great. That's cool. And you, and you got some good tourism in, in the meantime, in the middle, which yeah, is I cool. mean, I, I got, you know, because I lost my temper and took off, I ended up seeing the Tutankhamen exhibit, which was sold out across the country. Yeah, it was. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, being young and, and checking that out and, uh, and seeing the ads for it. So I'm glad you got to do that, Ace. It's, th- it's it's just such an incredible history, I, and I'm so glad you're back. I gotta write a second book. I really do. You do, because there's you know what it is, Ace. There's stuff now. I'm sure sometimes when you're right, you were writing your first book, you you yeah. remembered a lot of things, but then you were like, wait, oh man, I forgot that story. Did I include that story? You probably get to that point. I know. So yeah, I was just talking to my assistant, and, and he helped me, John Ostrowski. He helped me write the rewrite the first book, and. Uh, now I've been sober 17 years and my memory has cleared up a lot from the time I wrote the first book, which was, I don't know how long ago. Yeah. It's a great Eight book. Years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. But uh, I've, you know, I, I have a box filled with uh, little anecdotes and stories that I remembered after the fact that I want to put in my next book. But, you know, we would love that. And touring and, and, and everything else that I do. And then having to deal with family issues and this and that and the other thing. Yeah. Uh, but I know you'll do it. And Ace, you got to do it because uh, Kiss fans will love it. And and I know that what that's like when you remember something out of blue. You're like, oh, man, you know, I forgot to put that in the first book, right? So, hey, it's great, though. 17 years, congratulations. I'm three years and seven months and uh, sober. And um, I'm grateful to be. You know what I mean? Still, God bless you. Yeah, still doing it, Ace. Got to be. I want to stick around. You know. And it gets better and better every year. Believe you me. Yeah, and it's great. But my love for rock and roll. Want you know? I want to stay around, and enjoy it, enjoy the my friends, my kids. You know the whole deal. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, you know, I you know I was getting to a point where I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't deal with the hangovers and the, and the medications I was taking and the street drugs. And I took chances where I could have got arrested and thrown in jail. And uh, luckily, you know, I have my guardian angel watching over me and I never got arrested for drugs. Knock on wood. Yeah, I'm so glad you didn't, you know? But uh, the reality is, you know, you know, when you when I first got sober, you know, your disease is telling you, you're not gonna be as creative without all that junk in your system. System. And it turned out, you know, once I cleared up after several years, I was more creative. You were absolutely. That's that's the thing that I think a lot of artists go through, and people that are in, you know, the arts and and creative things, uh, they go through that thing. That's what it tells you. You're like, I'm never, you know, I'm not going to be the same, like you just mentioned. And then you realize it's it's better. The more time you you accumulate sober, the more time you put together, you're like, wow, I can think clearly. I'm, you know, you got that spark. That's How many albums have I done in the past nine, ten years? Yeah. So, I know. Think about it. It's amazing. This hasn't done a record in 20 years. I don't get that. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's great. I really do think it's uh, awesome that you do. And you also get to do those projects that are fun because you're sober and you have great friends. So you do the Origins 1 and 2, which was like getting together and paying tribute to the records that you love. I mean, you want to pick up a guitar and sing and play, right? Oh, I did. Those Origins records, I'm, I do songs that influenced me as a teenager or, you know, in my early 20s. Uh, and great songs back then. Oh, you know? yeah. Oh, my the God. Groups that, the groups I grew up with, like Hendrix, The Who, Clapton, Cream, you know, Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin, God. Jimi Hendrix, you know, I ended up rolling for Jimi Hendrix when I was 20 years old by accident. Tell I went me about to that. 
How did I that... went to the Peace concert at Randall's Island, which is an island right off Manhattan on the East River. And uh, I snuck into that. And I was watching the rock stars coming in and out of the uh, side of the stage. And nobody in those days had laminates or stick-ons. You know, this is 1970. And uh, I was, I had hair down to here. I was wearing a black t-shirt with a snakeskin star, lemon yellow hot pants and bands. <laughs> so I looked like I was in one of the bands. So all I did was uh, walk into the backstage area. And obviously there was a guard there like this, you know, six foot six. And all I did was look up at him and wink. And he just said, this guy's got to be in one of the bands. And he just let me walk backstage. After 15 minutes, you know, people are starting to ask, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. So finally, the, you know, the the uh, the head of production, the stage manager says, who are you? I go, I'm nobody. I I just came backstage and uh, the, the guard at the door didn't uh, stop me and I uh, I was talk. I was sitting talking to John Kay from Steppenwolf, and I forget a couple of the other people I was talking to. And he, you know, actually, they were short-staffed for that show because it was a peace concert, and everybody was working for free. So uh, he actually said, "You know, we're a little short-staffed. Is there anything you can do?" I go, "I can set up amps. I can tune guitars. I can set up drums. You know, whatever you want." Next thing you know, I'm setting up Mitch Mitchell's drums. You know? Yeah. And, and when I was 16 years old, I was walking around in high school with the Are You Experienced album under my arm. I just used to stare at it. You know? The the back cover was so awesome. All three of them have afros. And it's with their back. heads, yes, yeah, side by side, right? With Mitch and Noel. That's a fucking cool record. Out. And then the front album cover was great because it was like a, a weird lens. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I just used to stare at it, and of course the songs were fabulous on that record. And I used to play those songs and with with my club bands as I was growing up. And um, sometimes I'd have to slow down the turntable to figure out the guitar solos. Yeah, you know, which I which I've heard a lot of people uh, have told me they've done they've done this they did the same thing. Guys that are you know close to my age. You know, that's and, how they uh, learned. And then, of course, years later, people doing the same thing to learn your solos, Ace, <laughs> over the years. Uh, now you can do it in Pro Tools digitally. You, yeah, you but, can... uh, yeah but, uh, but the kids, like, they were going from the 70s and 80s, though, where they definitely had to do it. You know what I mean? By actually, you know, slowing the, down a record. Or... The only trouble with uh, when you slow down a record, it changed the pitch. Yes. But now that you have digital recording, you can slow down a, a, a song without changing the pitch you know the computer figures out uh, it, it's amazing to me. without changing the pitch so it's easier to learn something slowed down because you don't have to detune your, your guitar yes yeah, so i want you to know ace i love man those stories are incredible i i love that i the thing about you being backstage and doing setting up uh mitch mitchell's drums and, and no reading and hanging out so did you talk to those guys at all at that point or did you have to get off the same I, was, I was i was scared uh because i really held uh the Jimi hendrix experience they were like on a pedestal to me so but ironically do you remember mitch mitchell used to have an afro like like uh mitch mitch uh like the bass player and and jimmy yeah it was a period where he changed his image with a headband and a beard and he had long hair straight or just yeah. wavy well i didn't know this was right at the time he made that change and i hadn't seen any photographs of him with a new look so when he, he walked over uh i didn't know it was mitch mitchell initially until he said to the English roadie, he goes, uh, the English roadie said to him rather, hey, Mitch, which snare are you going to use tonight? And then I just like froze. And I said, this can't be happening. I'm dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> and here I am working with Mitch and the drum roadie and making the drums exactly the way he wanted them. And uh, then I got a chance to say hello to Jimmy and he thanked me for uh for working for free and helping out and uh it was great it was yeah. i mean you know you tell that story and 
half of the people I tell that story to doesn't believe it. I believe you. I totally believe you because I love that. It's just one of those things, those cool chance things. And, of course, when you're in New York or Los Angeles or cities like that, I mean, you know, because I haven't grown up in Jersey and spent a lot of time, almost a lot of time in New York, seeing all my rock shows in New York and New Jersey as a kid um, and growing up. Uh, I totally get it because you know it's just you, you're you're in places and you bump into people. It's amazing. I love that Ace. I want to thank you so much. I'm excited about the new record, February 23rd. Eleven songs. Working with Steve Brown is so great. You know, Steve's such a talent. I'm really happy you guys got together on this record. You know, yeah. The, the next single we're releasing is "Walking on the Moon," and the album is going to be released February 23rd, and in conjunction, we're releasing Cherry Medicine with the Cherry Medicine video. We're shooting three videos for the three singles. And uh, right now, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do for Walking on the Moon. You know, supposedly I'm going to be beamed down out of a UFO onto the moon. They're using green screens and stuff. And I got to sit down with the uh, director and see some of the artwork and uh, imagery he has. And uh, I'm probably going to meet with him next week on that. But uh, it's so weird. It's like uh, I'm ordering NASA space suits from Amazon and I'm <laughs> ordering alien suits. And, you know, the record company said, we'll reimburse you, Ace. You know, and I'm going to dress up a couple of friends as aliens. Yeah. I'm going to one of them and hand me my guitar once I get beamed down. From the UFO, but I don't want to give any more away. It sounds and, like it's going to be a lot of fun to shoot. It sounds like it's going to be a great time. Yeah, you know, and then, of course, Cherry Medicine, you know, the famous line in that is, you make me feel better when you're in your black leather. So we're going to have girls dressed up in black leather, and um, that's going to be a fun video. And they're planning to spend more money on that one, have my band also there, and... Um, they're talking about me driving up in a Ferrari. I don't know if that's still part of the uh, script, but, it, you know, it's cool. I mean, I got a whole bunch of uh, cherry uh, patches that uh, I'm going to have a, my sister sew onto a shirt. You know, it's like the old days with Kiss. I mean, you remember that shirt that uh, Gene used to wear in the beginning with the skull and crossbones? Yeah. Um, sewed those sewed that skull and crossbones on the t-shirt. She also sewed the uh, lightning bolt going up and down on my first costume, you know? That's so great. You know, and it, that belt I was wearing, I made that myself. See, I love that. I mean, you guys were like, that was the thing, because you were creative guys. You thought creatively. It was cool, you know? I know what I wanted, and I didn't have the money <laughs> to buy it, so... I had to create it, you know. I created the Kiss logo one day, you know, with a felt tip pen. And uh, I don't know if you ever seen the Kiss button, but you know, there's a diamond over the eye and there's lips under the logo. And then we decided to drop the lips and the uh, diamond over the eye and just have Kiss, you know. And then uh, Paul refined it with a rapidograph pen because he went to music and art, and he he was a uh, he was a better artist than me in, in the, as far as, you know, doing stuff perfectly, you know. Yeah, it's great, man. It's what a, it, it's so much history. And it's yeah, inspired it was, and influenced us all. You know what I mean? I'm telling you. How we all just, things just fell into place. It was almost like destiny. Yeah. That's all I can tell you. And this new album, I'm so excited about. Every, every interview I've done... Uh, the interviewer who's heard the whole record is just saying, Ace, there's no filler on this record. Yeah, it's really killer, Ace. I'm very excited I'm just, about it. Just chopping at the bit. Uh, it's, I want to hear the feedback from the fans after the February 23rd, and that's going to be great. Because yeah, I, I'm sure it's going to be hopefully mostly positive. I think it will be, Ace. So, you know, listen, again, thank you so much for doing this. So great to have you on here, Ace. Really had fun talking about stories about the new I record and about all the great stuff great history and again thank you for that i'll never forget for the rest of my life the day i got to sing with you and with peter and with gene three kiss songs that was like again one of those things where you're like did that really happen did i ever do it and it was beautiful it was unbelievable. 
my whole life feels like it's been a movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. You know? And I'm thinking about doing a movie of my life because it's one of the most interesting stories of anybody. Oh, I agree. I think people I think people would love it. And it's gotta be done. So oh. thank thank you so much, Ace. February twenty third, the new album, Ten Thousand Volts, is coming out. I'm Matt Pinfield. It's been great to have Ace Freely here on KLOS New and Approved. Thanks so much for having me on and say I wanna say hi to all the fans and thank you for all your support. The KISS fans, the Ace Frehley fans, and the new fans who are popping up on uh, my TikTok account, which has already got over a million views in less than a month. That's Go fantastic. It. Yeah, it's so great, Ace. <laughs> See, it's multi-generational, too, which is the great thing about it. I'm Matt Pinfield for Ace Frehley and myself and KLOS. We'll see you soon.